Hey you guys, welcome to the first lecture in a series of videos from Best Medicine for students who are doing AQAG CSE Biology in the UK. This video, this lecture series is completely free of cost and this is for students who especially are trying to become doctors, who are aspiring to become doctors. So this is a free, complete, one-of-a-kind series that is specific for AQA GCSE Biology students in the UK. Um, now, something that is new in this series is that we have changed the way we're going to teach science, we're going to teach biology, because we have ditched the boring old suits and the boring old people in a suit, right? We're going to learn through memes, trying to, well, you know, what good would be science if you cannot understand new entertainment, new memes, right? Memes are life, at least for me, and so I'm going to teach you through them. Now, before beginning this, um, I would like to request all of you to watch the introductory video. It contains a lot of Im important information, a lot of key information that will help you learn and help you get accustomed before you start to this playlist. Also, um, if you would like any extra, extra help, um, make sure to reach out to us using the WhatsApp link below. And yeah, so let's begin with the first lecture that is uh, going to be on cell structure and transport. So before beginning this, because we're just starting, let's just focus on what biology really is. Can you tell me what biology is? Biology, it is the study of, the study of living things, right? The study of living things. The study of organisms. So when we say it is the study of living things or organisms, or we say, uh, we're going to learn everything about the living things, everything about the organisms, how they live, where they live, how they interact with each other, how they interact with their environment, what they are made up of, how they function, what foods do they eat, how do they um, reproduce, how do they evolve, and even what molecules that they are made up of. So, because we're going to be studying everything about the living things, it would be sensible to start with something very, very small, like something that would make them up, right? What would make up living things? Well, that's very easy. All living things are made up of, and you've probably heard of this before, cells, right? Every living thing, all organisms are made up of cells. So, some organisms are made up of one cell. And we call them unicellular organisms, right? Unicellular. And then some organisms are made up of multiple cells. And we call them multicellular organisms, right? So unicellular organisms and multicellular organisms. Unicellular organisms would include something like what? Prokaryotes, bacteria, and archaea, wouldn't it? So this would include something like bacteria and archaea and protists. Multicellular organisms would include something like animals, right? Animals are multicellular organisms because they're made up of multiple cells. They're very, very big and you need a lot of cells to make bodies that big. Also plants. Plants are multicellular organisms and fungi. Now, some fungi can exist as unicellular as well, so that's a bit on the both sides for fungi. Now, when we talk about a cell, which is the basic building block of all of these living things, a cell contains some key components, some key parts. Let me just quickly draw a sample, maybe an animal cell here. So let me just draw an animal cell here, and that's a cell. Now. A cell, normally, an animal cell at least, should contain this one here, which is called the cell membrane. We're going to come to that in a bit. A cytoplasm. And a nucleus. Mm -hmm. A nucleus. Now, there are living things in which the cells do not contain a nucleus. And those are called prokaryotes or prokaryotic organisms <clears throat> prokaryotes let's write that down here prokaryotes Ugh, I can't spell prokaryotes 
do not have a nucleus. Well, eukaryotes, so this one, this cell is a eukaryote, do have a nucleus. Can you give me some examples of prokaryotes and some examples of eukaryotes? What do you think? Prokaryotes would be something like a bacteria, right? Bacteria. What else? Archaea, wouldn't it? For, for eukaryotes, we have plants again, animals, fungi, and the only unicellular organism that is a eukaryote is protists. Protists are eukaryotes. Protists would include water living organisms such as amoeba. You probably heard of that in year eight. Amoebas are protists. All right, so here, cell structure and transport. That's how it begins. And therefore, what we are right now are some biologists, which we're just a bunch of cells that talk about other cells, right? Okay, so let's begin. Here's a meme for starters, right? You can pause in any of these memes and have fun. Uh, this is my favorite part. When I study science to understand science memes, <laughs> that's how my heart shakes. Okay. So, the introduction that so far we have done is that organisms can exist as either prokaryotes or eukaryotes, and all living entities are composed of cells. Now, cells can either fall into categories of prokaryotic or eukaryotic. Eukaryotic cells are the ones that contain a nucleus and any other membrane-enclosed organelles, such as, and we'll see in a bit, something like a mitochondria. On the other hand, prokaryotic cells, such as bacteria and archaea, are smaller and less complex. They don't have any... Uh, they don't have any nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles. So eukaryotes, they include animals, plants, fungi, and protists, while prokaryotes include bacteria and archaea. Cell components are termed subcellular structures. They're also called organelles. All right, so the first types of cells that we're going to do today are animal cells. Animal cells possess the subsequent subcellular structures, subsequent organelles that we're going to discuss. Number one, we have the membrane that encloses the cells, and that is called the cell membrane, right? The cell membrane. So what is the function of the cell membrane? Well, the cell membrane controls what goes in and out of the cell. It is a partially permeable, or you could also say selectively permeable membrane because it selects what uh, is permeated into the cell. For example, uh, let's say water wants to go into the cell, right? So water would be allowed to go into the cell. However, if I get some glucose and glucose wants to go into the cell, now normally glucose would not be simply allowed to go into the cell. It would probably need some special channels for it to go through. So that is selective permeability. And that is what the cell membrane has. So cell membrane is selectively permeable. It is partially permeable, which means it controls what goes in and out of the cell. Number two, we have the nucleus. What does a nucleus do? So this right here is the nucleus. What does a nucleus do? The nucleus actually contains all the genetic information, all the DNA. The DNA contains genes on uh, its surface, which code for functions of the cell. So it controls cells' activities by controlling regulation of genes. If you turn on a gene, a function will turn on. If you turn off a gene, a function will turn off, right? So that's pretty simple. So by regulating gene expression. On DNA. If you've never seen the DNA, let me just quickly show you how the DNA looks like. Probably seen this in movies or cartoons. Kind of looks like this, right? A helical double-stranded structure kind of looks like this. So what this contains really is that it contains on its surface 
So here's the surface of the DNA, and here's the surface. Probably contains a gene here and a gene here, right? And each of these code for some functions. For example, this could code for something like, if you have blue eyes, right? That could code, code for blue eyes, right? Curly hair. Mm -hmm. Or a gene for a hormone, like you've, you've probably heard of insulin. Insulin, right? So all these are genes. Genes are present inside the uh, DNA, and DNA is present inside the nucleus. So if you control which genes are being expressed, you control what functions are going to be regulated in the cell, okay? These genes, they actually code for proteins, and then those proteins would go ahead and perform some functions. For example, insulin is a protein. The thing that makes your hair curly is probably a protein. The thing that gives color to your eyes is also a protein. So proteins would essentially perform the functions. Now, what makes proteins in a cell, once it gets this information or instruction from the nucleus, from the DNA, is something called a ribosome. A ribosome would make a protein. So here's a ribosome. Let's just grab onto this and write that down here. Ribosome. Ribosomes, they get instructions from the nucleus or from the DNA to make proteins, right? So they make proteins. Very, very important. Well, all of this is secondary to energy, right? If we don't have energy, then we would not be able to do all these functions. So what in the cell makes energy? Any guesses? It is called the mitochondria, right? So mitochondria, which is also known as the powerhouse of the cell, makes energy. Here's a mitochondria. If you look at this, it's probably got, If you, you can probably notice that it's got an outer membrane and an inner membrane, right? So that's the difference between a chloroplast, which you'll see in a bit, and a mitochondria. Uh, mitochondria has a smooth outer membrane and a folded inner membrane. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever seen an image on the, on the exam, you should be able to recognize which one is the mitochondria. Now mitochondria, because it is the powerhouse of the cell, it is going to use glucose that we eat and oxygen that we breathe to make energy in a process called aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration means using glucose, let's write that down here, so glucose plus using oxygen that we breathe to make energy. And some waste products, for example, the gas that we breathe out, which is carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so mitochondria is the organelle responsible for making energy in a cell. It does this by aerobic respiration in which glucose and oxygen are used as fuels to make energy and two waste products, CO2 and H2O. All right, okay. Again, all this will be summarized in your notes, so you can always rewatch the videos, take down your own notes, or you can purchase these notes from the number provided underneath the videos, all right? Okay, so we have these notes here, basically tell you the same thing, and then we have a little bit of a meme here, mitochondria in the textbook, pretty clear to me. Mitochondria in the exam. Well, how much I have suffered because of this. Cannot identify a single thing. All right, so the next cells in the series are plant cells. After animal cells, plant cells also possess similar components found in animal cells, but they have some additional features that we'll learn today. So they are, um, typically they possess the same components as the animal cells, along with some additional features that are absent in animal cells. For example, they have something called a cell wall, right? A cell wall right here on the very outside. So that's the cell wall. And this is made up of something called cellulose. Cellulose is actually made of glucose. So plants are able to use glucose to make cell wall. What does a cell wall do? Well, the cell wall is very rigid, first of all. Because it's very rigid, it gives the cell its shape. It's quite rigid, it makes it strong, gives the cell its regular shape, maintains the cell shape, makes it rigid, gives it integrity, and if a lot of water, let's say, was to move in, right, some, for some reason, we move a lot of water into the cell, normally an animal cell would just burst, right, an, an animal cell would just burst, but a plant cell 
is will not burst. It will just become swollen and pressurized, and we call that turgid. So we'll mention that later. So that is what the cell wall does. It gives support and strength for the plant cell, uh, plant cells, and maintains its regular shape. Next up, we have a large centralized vacuole. So this is a permanent large, and you could also say centralized vacuole. What is a vacuole? A vacuole is an area that contains water and dissolved materials, such as enzymes, nutrients, and waste products. The third thing that plant cells contain, and is very, very important, is this green thing here. This little component here is called a chloroplast. Chloroplast. What's a chloroplast? Have you heard of this? A chloroplast, let me just quickly make this. The way this looks like, and it's very different from mitochondria, remember mitochondria? Smooth outer membrane, folder, folded, inner membrane. Chloroplast looks kind of like this. It has both the membranes together. So uh, you probably are not going to be able to identify the two different membranes. But it contains these stacks of chlorophyll here. So that's the chloroplast. That's how it looks like. So on the exam, you should be able to differentiate the two. It doesn't have a smooth outer membrane, folded inner membrane. Instead, it's got uh, these stacks of chlorophyll. Now, what does the chloroplast do? Basically, it contains this chlorophyll. And chlorophyll, uh, let's just say, performs... Chlorophyll helps absorb sunlight to drive um, the process of photosynthesis. Have you heard of photosynthesis before? Photosynthesis is the process in which plant cells absorb sunlight, carbon dioxide, use carbon dioxide and water to make glucose and oxygen. So they perform photosynthesis, right? Using light energy that is absorbed by what pigment, what green colored pigment in the chloroplast? It's called the, the chlorophyll. Chlorophyll, right? Now, making chlorophyll, and you might want to remember this, it needs an ion, magnesium ions. Magnesium ions are absorbed by the roots of the plant and they help make chlorophyll. So that's very important for green leaves and for good photosynthesis. All right, so that's the end of plant cells. Again, it's summarized in your notes. And here's a meme to close things off. Cell wall, because it's very rigid, it also helps support the plant as a whole. It doesn't totally, it's not the only component that performs this function. Later on, we'll also study something called lignin that is deposited in another part of the plant that helps support the wood and stems. But cell wall is also a rigid component that gives the plant stems and wood a stiffness. So next type of cells that we have in the series are prokaryotes. Remember, prokaryotes are unicellular organisms. And they have a nucleus or don't have a nucleus? What do you think? They do not have a nucleus, right? They do not have a nucleus. So here's a sample prokaryote for you. That's a bacteria or an archaea. And they have a couple of features. Number one, the similarities first. They have a cytoplasm, right? Cytoplasm. So similarities is going to be in blue and differences are going to be in red. Cytoplasm. They have a cytoplasm. Okay. They have a DNA. But their DNA is out in the open because they don't have a nucleus. And they're... DNA is circular, looped, not straight like a line. And they have a cell membrane. And another thing that they have are ribosomes because they need to make proteins as well. Of course, if they have the DNA and DNA codes for gene, DNA contains genes that code for functions by coding for proteins, then you got to make proteins. And make, making proteins is a job of of ribosomes. So cytoplasm, DNA, cell membrane, and ribosomes. These are the similarities between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. 
what are the differences well no nucleus nucleus chloroplast mitochondria because all of those were membrane bound organelles remember e chloroplast had two membranes mitochondria had two membranes obviously nucleus has a nuclear membrane so no membrane bound organelles number two they have a cell wall which is a bit different from the uh, from the uh, the animal cell because animal cells don't have a cell wall and plant cell cell wall is made up of cellulose while animal cells cell wall is made up of something else again that you do not need to know for AQA but you do need to know for other boards which I'm not going to mention because this is for AQA only so cell wall they also have a flagella flagella are uh, these motile components that help bacteria and archaea to swim from one place to another they also have something called pili these are extensions of the cell membrane that help allow the bacteria to be able to bind to certain things as well as to be able to travel and their dna remember is looped or circular everything is in the open okay all right so very quickly let's just uh summarize this again so they lack a nucleus they lack membrane bound organelles for example they don't have any mitochondria they don't have any chloroplast number three these are unicellular organisms and their genetic material is a single circular dna molecule ribosomes are present cell wall for, for structural support plasma membrane is present of course and they can have flagella for movement and in a bit we will see some flagella uh, when we talk about some specialized cells like the sperm cell and here's a meme to close things off oh so you're a prokaryotic cell are you bacteria or archaea that's the wrong spelling of archaea all right so the next topic in this series is going to be microscopes because we have been talking about cells but we haven't really looked at uh how to look at cells right so we gotta we gotta explore things into looking at cells. How did how were cells discovered, and how can we view cells, and what is the method of viewing cells, what is the method of pre preparing a microscopic slide? All those things are very high yield for for uh, AQA GCSE. They can ask you why how to prepare a slide, how how to prepare a slide section. They can also ask you for how can you adjust a microscope to have a good uh, resolution to get to have a good detail and again to answer all those questions of course i'll teach you here but to the best way to answer this would be to get coaching um, for uh, exam practice and for that you can uh, reach us out at the number provided under the video all right so let's begin here is a light microscope. Of course, if you want to see a cell in before, if you're very, very familiar with the microscope, and that is used to view cells, we can use a light microscope. What's a light microscope? A light microscope means that it's going to use light to illuminate the cells that we're going to put on a slide. So here's how it works. Basically, in this light microscope, you have a lamp. Of course, you have a lamp because it's a light microscope. You have a light, right? A lamp, a light source. And that's going to, that, that is going to send the light through the slide so that we're able to view it from the, from the top. Okay, so the other components of this particular uh, microscope's parts are the base. And this is called a stage. All right. And that's a slide. And on top of this, if you're able to see the little square shaped thin glass, that's called a cover slip. A cover slip. This lens is called the objective lens. And this lens here is called the eyepiece lens. Also, something very important for examination purposes are these adjustment knobs. Adjustment knobs, 
you're you're expected to be familiar with how they work. Adjustment knobs. There's two. One of them is more fine than the other. There's one that is fine, and they expect you to know. And they can give you a question on this. They expect you to know how these are used, how you can focus a blurry slide into a clear image using these adjustment knobs. So that is very high yield for for examination purposes. So uh, let's quickly go review what we have learned so far. We have learned that there's a light source, and light source is useful. Um, you, it uses visible light for illumination, magnification. Uh, Comparable to electron microscopes, which we're going to do in a bit, they have a lower magnification. Uh, light microscopes have a lower magnification, which means that we're not able to actually see those very fine details, like very su small subcellular structures uh, like organelles in detail. We we're not able to see ribosomes, we're not able to see clearly the cell membrane, things like that. Magnification, um, uh, then we have resolution. Resolution essentially means the amount of detail that you're able to see, the amount of clarity that you're able to see in an image. And again, resolution is also limited. You usually get a slightly blurry image. It's not very clear when you use a microscope, the light microscope. The specimen type that can be observed, uh, contrary to <clears throat> the electron microscope, you can also see living specimens moving, for example, bacteria or very small things. You're able to see them using a light microscope in very thin samples. Um, cost and size, of course, you should be well aware that these are more affordable and compact. And at the cellular components, they are only able to visualize larger cellular structures. For example, you can see cell walls of plants, nuclei, chloroplasts, but you, you won't be able to see ribosomes. You won't be able to see very, very small structures of a cell. For that, you will need an electron microscope. Now, electron microscope, instead of using light to illuminate the specimen, this is going to send a ray of electrons through the specimen. Now, when you send a ray of electrons <laughs> through a specimen, you're literally sending, if you've studied in physics, radiation, and that is quite dangerous. And so the specimen that you usually observe is dead. So let's have a look at the differences. Electron microscopes, they use electrons for illumination. Their magnification obviously is higher compared to light microscopes. Their resolution is superior. However, for specimen type, always a non-living specimen, okay? And cost and size, this is obviously more expensive. And the cellular components that you're able to see are the very fine details of mitochondria, chloroplast. You're able to see ribosomes, plasmids, things like that. Plasmids are uh, loops of DNA inside a bacteria. Another thing that I might want to mention here is that microscopes use colorful dyes. Use colorful dyes. For example, you can use something like a iodine, iodine as a dye. For electron microscopes, they use heavy metal dyes. So the way this would work is that, um, let's say you have a specimen. I'm just going to make a specimen here, and you're trying to look at it. The way this is going to work is that you're throwing electrons, right? electrons and electrons and normally normally these electrons should be able to go straight through because electrons are quite penetrating and so you should be able to see no image on the screen behind it however if you put a die here some heavy metal die right on this particular sample what's going to occur is that this and at certain places the die would accumulate more than the others and so these electrons would bounce off right, uh, from sub certain places and go through certain places, giving you a particular uh, high-resolution image of the, of the specimen. All right, so let's have a look at some images. Here, that's a red blood cell. This is how a red blood cell looks on the top, if you see. That's how a red blood cell looks. A red blood cells, by the way, are cells in your blood that carry oxygen, and they look red. They look red. So that's how it looks on the microscope, quite blurry if you ask me, right, and not very detailed. But look how clear it is, although not colored, with the electron microscope. Uh, this is a white blood cell. 
white blood cells or cells in your blood um, that help form your immune system and they protect you from diseases. And that's how it looks under the, under the light microscope, but with an electron microscope, it's very, very detailed. Look, we're, we're even, even able to see these little vacuoles here, very small uh, temporary vacuoles, uh, maybe some ribosomes here, and we're able to see nuclei in very much detail. So all these things are very, very uh, high resolution, high detail with the electron microscope. Okay. Uh, so again, just to emphasize on this, we have a little table here in which here's the things that we can see with the human eye. Uh, obviously, we can see a tree, but then till the end, we were able to see with the human eye. But then we, when, as soon as we come to cell, we're able to see them using a using microscopes. So light microscopes should be able to uh, show a structures till, till one micrometers and smaller than that. That's going to be the electron microscopes. Of course, if you want to see more details of the larger structures, you can also use an electron microscope. So electron microscopes, you're, you're even able to see viruses. So far uh, in our discussion of uh, living things, we haven't actually mentioned viruses. And usually the reason for this is because we're studying cells and viruses are not made of cells. In fact, it is debated upon whether they actually qualify as true living things. So we will leave that for, for later. Right. Now the whole purpose of using microscopes is to be able to magnify smaller objects into bigger size. Now for AQA GCSC, one of the most emphasized things related to microscopes is to be able to either calculate magnification or to be able to use magnification. So what is magnification? Magnification is that let's say you are observing a small thing for example here's a eukaryotic cell let's say that this eukaryotic cell uh, over here is um, 10 micrometers as it says but when you look in the microscope you find out or on an image you find out that you can see around five centimeters of a cell. So a cell appears this big and then when you measure it with a ruler, so you grab your ruler, right, and you put it here and you measure it. And what you get is five centimeters. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's obviously much bigger than 10 micrometers, which is its actual size. So what's going on here? Well, obviously it has been magnified, right? That's why we're able to see it using the, um, using the microscope. So the way magnification cal can be calculated, and that's what they want you to do, is by using a formula. How can you calculate the magnification if you know the original size, actual size, right, and the size of the image? Well, the formula for this is magnification equals to image height over object height, or image size over object size, all right? So that's pretty simple. Let me just quickly work this out for this uh, particular example. So our image size, for example, is 5 centimeters, right? 5 centimeters is our image that we see on the screen or on a computer or on a microscope or even, even a paper. 10 micrometers is the actual size of the object, right? The object's actual size. So object size is 10 micrometers. Now the first thing you want to do is we want to get these numbers in similar units as each other, maybe even standard units, or similar units as each other, whichever one is better. So let's try to convert maybe five centimeters into micrometers so that we can divide the two. So for example, can you try to do this by yourself? Five centimeters is how many millimeters? Five centimeters is 50 millimeters, right? And there are 1,000 micrometers in every millimeters, which means 50 times 1,000 micrometers. That's going to be 50,000 uh, micrometers. So 10 micrometer real object is visible to us uh, at a length of 50,000 micrometers. So let's, let's, just, let's plug this in our formula and calculate this. So magnification is going to be 50,000 divided by 10, right? And that's going to be 5,000 times. So this has been magnified 5,000 times. 
uh, this is a very high magnification. Usually, <laughs> this would only be possible using an electron microscope. Uh, now, similarly, you could do the opposite. You can go, um, you can go from the magnification into the image size. So, let's say you have a cell, and they say the cell is 50 micrometers, right? So, they a cell is 50 micrometers, and they say that the magnification. Uh, of the microscope that you're using is 400 times, right? And they asked you what is the what is the size of the image that you observe in centimeters. So let's try to calculate this, or in millimeters. Let's try to calculate this. So again, the formula is m equals to image height over object height, right? Now we want to find, in this case, the image height. So that's what we want to find out. So let's plug this in the in the formula. We have 400, which is the magnification, equals to I over 50 micrometers. So that's 400 times 50, which is how much? 20,000, right? So 400 times 50 equals to 20 thousand micrometers. 20,000 micrometers in millimeters is how much? 20,000 divided by 1,000 equals to 20 millimeters. That's our image size in millimeters. Okay, and that would be two centimeters. So that is the formula and that is how you're supposed to use it. Again, do a lot of practice, um, lots and lots of practice, lots and lots of questions on this, and you should be good. So let's have a look at the uh, neat notes again. Um, before we go into this, let me just quickly take you back to the microscope again, the light microscope. And I want to tell you something a little bit extra. I'm telling you anything that's going to be extra out of um, the AQA syllabus or never before seen on it, but still for good knowledge, I will let you know beforehand. So this is a little bit extra, but it's good to know. You can use the objective lens and the eyepiece lens as magnifications to calculate the total magnification of the of the microscope that uh, that you're going to be using. So for example, let's say you're using this particular microscope. Now, let's say your eyepiece lens's magnification is uh, let's say 20 times, right? 20 times. Objective lenses, you're able to rotate the three, you have three of these here. And each of them would have their own relative, ma uh, respective magnifications uh, labeled on them. So let's say over here, the one that we're using right now is 40 times, right? And we're using an eyepiece lens of 20 times. Then our total magnification is going to be, but I think eyepiece lens has a very smaller, a much smaller magnification, maybe 10. So. So that would be a total, would be a product of the two. So what you want to do is multiply the eyepiece lens magnification with the objective lens magnification to get the total magnification. So that would be 40 times 10, and that's going to be 400 times is your magnification. So you get a product of the eyepiece lens and the objective lens, and that is your total magnification. All right, so again, magnification, especially the formula, which is magnification equals to image height over object height is super, super important for AQA. <clears throat> All right, so let's quickly review this magnification again. Magnification equals to image, ice, image size divided by actual object size. Magnification can also be collaborated by microscope lenses magnifications multiplied with each other. For example, 40 times 20 is 800. Um, something that you might want to review, and this is uh, something that was really, really severely tested on, especially this year in, in the GCSCs, AQA, even in, um, especially in physics, is the conversions. The conversion of units is very, very important. Now, I'm not going to teach you a lot over here in biology, but I put a photo here um, in your notes, and if you want to buy these notes, you can buy them, you can take screenshots off of these videos, but conversions are very, very important and you want to practice these and learn them as much as you can. And if you need some help, just uh, the, the number is right under this video. You can let us know 
and we'll try to find some help, all right? Okay, so let's try to do an example question. Um, here's an example. An image from a light microscope is provided as shown below. The actual width of the cell marked is 80 micrometers. So they're saying it's 80 micrometers. Measure and calculate the magnification of the microscope. Measure and calculate. That's a key word there. Measure and calculate. What you want to do here is take your ruler out and measure the size of this. Okay, so here's, we take our ruler out, right? Uh, this one doesn't have calibrations, but your ruler will. And so you measure the size of this. Let's say I measure it to be 8 centimeters or something. Okay, so let's say this is 8 centimeters. And that's 80 micrometers. So 8 centimeters, 8 times 10 that's 80 millimeters times 1,000. That's 80,000 micrometers. Um, and I get my formula. I say magnification equals to image size over object size equals to 80,000 divided by 80, right? And I get how much? I get 1,000 times. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Um, and down below, I've uh, done this question using a 5 centimeter length. I have a bon bonus question for you guys. Um, if magnification of the objective lens is above 100 times, what is the magnification of the eyepiece lens in, in this particular uh, example? So can you let me know in the comments? I'll be waiting for your answer. And it would be great if you can also write your name or nickname. Um, in the comments so I know who you are in future videos as well. All right. So for this question, I think you should use this particular magnification to do this question, okay? So use 625 to do this, to do this particular question. All right, so the next question is, how can we prepare a slide? How can we prepare a slide for viewing under a microscope? So for that, um, this particular section will prepare you. So basically, what you have is usually, number one, you will have a scalpel, right? A scalpel will help you cut the specimen. For example, if you're observing a potato um, cells or onion cells or whatever it is, you'll have a scalpel first, which will help you cut it in very thin pieces, right? So you want cut into very thin pieces, very thin pieces. Why do, why do you want the pieces to be thin? Remember, you're using a light microscope. So because you're using a light microscope, you want the light to go through the cells. And that's why you want the very thin pieces. And this is a question that has shown up before. So very thin pieces using the scalpel. Number two, you would have the glass slide. And number three, you'll have the cover slip. So you'll have the glass slide. Um, Right, and you'll put the specimen using forceps, using forceps, place, specimen, on the glass slide. Okay, now next thing you want to do is you want to stain it with a dye so that you're able to see uh, the different colors. So number three is going to be add the staining dye. And you can have many of these. One of, for example, iodine is one, one popular one for GCSEs. Not very popular for medicine. For medicine, they use something called hematoxylin and eosin. And then number four, we have to uh, place the cover slip on it and for that we'll use something called a mounted needle So it's just basically a needle that helps you hold a hold the cover slip adjacent to the to the thin specimen and then you slowly uh, Very slowly tilt it so that it lands on top of the specimen. Okay, so mounted needle Tilt the cover slip on top of the specimen. 
Okay. So on your left, you should be able to see very beautiful slides here. So um, these are very thin sections. And the reason why they're very thin sections, again, is because you want the light to go through. They're, they were placed on the glass slide initially, and then using a mounted needle, the cover slips that you can see here, there, there's a circular one here, there's a square one here. They were slowly tilted and layered on top of the specimen after adding the dye, okay? Now, after the slide is prepared, you put it on the stage. After putting it on the stage, you adjust the, um, adjust the zoom, how much magnification you want to use. <clears throat> and then, using the adjustment knobs, the first thing you want to do is you want to pull the stage up as close to the lens as possible, okay? So using the adjustment knobs, you're going to pull the stage up as close to the uh, lens as possible. And then using the fine adjustment knob, you're going to start lowering it down while looking at it, okay? So you're looking at it and lowering it down, and at some point, you will eventually end up seeing a clear image, okay? And that's your spot. So that is how you use a light microscope. Again, this is very high yield, often tested. And you can review this video and read the notes attached to it to be able to uh, review it better, okay? Now, I have a question for you guys again, and I would like for you guys to answer in the comments. Why was a very thin section of specimen cut and observed, right? Why was it very thin? Two marks, okay, answer in the comments with your nicknames. Thank you very much. Now, another part of the required practical is that uh, you're able to draw your observations. So whatever you see, you're able to draw them. I'm going to very quickly show you basically, um, and it's very simple, the way you, you're gonna be able to make this work is that you're gonna have an image. Let's say here's an image, whatever it has. Let's say it has something like this, and you wanna draw this. So, or, or you're, you're seeing this in a microscope and you wanna draw this. So how would you draw this in a sample space? Well, to be able to draw this, the first thing you wanna grab is a very sharp pencil, okay? A very sharp pencil. And you want to draw it in continuous lines, no shading, covering most of the area that they have provided in the, uh, in the paper. And you want to That makes sense? So you want to make sure that the proportions uh, of the uh, of the image that you see and your drawing of it are equal, okay? For example, if you're observing cellular structures and on the image, uh, on the microscope, you see a nucleus that is quite small, but on the image that you draw, if you, you, you draw a very big nucleus, then that is a problem, okay? And you're going to lose marks. So make sure that the proportions are uh, also correct. So again, that's quite high yield for required practicals is that you want to have a sharp tip. You, you want to use at least half of the available space that they have given you. You don't want to do any coloration or shading, continuous lines with sharp pencil only. And you want to maintain proportion. That is very, very important. Okay. And of course, you want to give a title, record the magnification, and identify any significant features that um, you, you want to label, all right? Uh, okay, so to close things off, you have a meme. What you see through the microscope and what the bacteria sees. <laughs> okay. Okay, so next up uh, is one of my favorite parts of the entire series actually and one of the one of my favorite parts in all of biology um, this is also very 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 important if you want to become doctors this is something that you'll be using throughout your uh, career is uh, the knowledge and understanding of dna of gene expression and differentiation and stem cells so, um, what is differentiation and specialization? Specialization or differentiation is when normal cells, stem cells, essentially, and I'll tell you what those are, those are undifferentiated, unspecialized cells, 
they become specialized to be able to uh, to be able to perform very specific functions. For example, you have a general cell, and then that gives a muscle cell, and muscle cell performs the muscle cell function. Or you have a general cell, and that gives a liver cell or a skin cell, right? So that is called specialization, or that is also called differentiation. How do cells become differentiated? Before we go into this, we have to understand where do the stem cells come from, which give rise to those differentiated cells. So for this, let's go ahead and try to go back to the origins of a of an organism, of a multicellular organism. Because again, <laughs> multicellular organisms would be the ones that have specialized cells, right? Because we have specialized organs. So let's take humans for, for an example. Humans, right? how we originate right so we have a we have the sperm cell and then we have half the dna coming from the sperm that's going to be from the father and then we have the egg cell right and half dna comes from the mother and then when both of these fertilize they form something called a zygote and this zygote is going to be going to have full dna right and then this zygote this good guy zygote is going to go ahead and start dividing, right, and form a clump of cells, and that's an embryo that's going to be implanted in the uterus, and then that's going to become a baby, right, a person, isn't it? So how does this clump of similar-looking cells with same DNA, every cell would have same DNA as it comes from one cell, right, become this entire organism? And... A very big question, a very, very big question, and I think you should pause the video and think about it, is if the zygote comes from the male and female parents, right, and has the entire DNA, and all the cells that come, basically an organism, entire organism comes from the zygote, entire human being comes from the zygote, then the entire human being has the same DNA as the zygote. So if it has the same DNA, then the entire human being should have the same functions, right? Why are functions different in different parts of our body? For example, liver has its own function, and brain has its own function, and bones have their own function, and skin has their own function, even though they come from the zygote and they share the same DNA. So DNA in brain cells, DNA in liver cells, skin cells is the same. So how are the functions of all of these cells different? That is the question pause the video and think about it before I tell you the answer. Okay, so the answer to this is differentiation or specialization. So how does this work? Well, undifferentiated cells, such as those that you see here, which haven't really become any organs, are called stem cells. Okay, stem cells. And we have two different kinds of stem cells. Uh, we'll do more on these later as well, but we have two different kinds of stem cells. We have embryonic stem cells in the embryo, uh, which we see here in this case. And they can give rise to all cells, an entire human being. And then we have adult stem cells. Yes, as, as adults, and as adults, we also have, um, we also have stem cells. But these stem cells are not the same as embryonic stem cells because they can only form certain types of cells. For example, blood cells, right? Uh, if red blood cells die or white blood cells die, we have some stem cells that can give rise to um, red blood cells and white blood cells. But if a neuron was to die, we don't have stem cells for that, right? So that's adult stem cells. They can only form some cells, okay? For example, blood cells white blood cells and red blood cells and so on so the embryo the stem cells will become differentiated into different kinds of cells so how do they do this if they have the same dna right if the dna is the same and we already looked at the function of dna then the functions of all the stem cells should be the same because dna codes for proteins and proteins determine our functions so if the DNA is the same, then the genes should be the same. If the genes are the same, the proteins made should be the same. And if the proteins are the same, then the functions for all the cells should be the same. The answer to this is because during the process of differentiation, we're able to turn certain genes off and certain genes on. So for example, let's just uh, show you a uh, DNA. So let's say here's the DNA, and then we have this portion here and that portion there. 
Hopefully that's not very visible. Let's change the color. Okay, this portion here and that portion there and that portion there. So let's say this is the area that codes for liver, liver function, okay? Liver genes, liver genes. And then here we have the skin genes. And here we have the brain genes, right, from a stem cell. So we're here inside the nucleus of a stem cell, okay? So that's the nucleus, that's the cell. Now, here's what we're going to do. What we do is we turn certain genes on, keep certain genes on, turn certain genes off to differentiate cells. So, for example, if we want to make liver cells, then we will turn these genes off. Okay, you are gone, and you are gone, brain genes are gone and skin genes are gone only liver genes are going to be on similarly if you want to make skin cells from stem cells then we will turn only those genes on that help determine the functions of a skin cell rather than a liver cell or a brain cell do you understand so that is the process of differentiation or specialization and that's one of my favorite topics so i i know it's a, a little bit difficult i've tried to make it easy but you might want to might want to review this uh, part of the video again okay all right so just to quickly review this how do cells become differentiated remember that cells come from undifferentiated cells stem cells now let's read this through so cell functions are coded by genes found on the dna and different genes code for different functions now dna present in all cells of an organism is the same except for gametes so because the dna is the same then genes are also the same right and if genes are the same that should mean that uh, they should have identical functions but they don't of course right liver and muscle cells they have very different functions so specialization would occur from stem cells by sequential turning on and off of genes you turn certain genes off and certain genes on to specialize a cell so unspecialized cells again this is already written in this uh, different font color is that unspecialized cells also called stem cells turn certain genes on and certain genes off to develop into specialized cells for example skin cells and muscle cells and blood cells okay so in an embryo embryonic stem cells can form all types of cells in an adult human there are only a limited number of adult stem cells and they can only form a limited number of new stems uh, new new cells okay yep okay so the first specialized cell that we're going to study is the sperm cell you've probably heard of this i just drew it right a short while ago so a sperm cell carries half the dna from the father during the process of sexual reproduction before fertilization can occur so how does a sperm look let's have a look so it kind of goes like this like a triangle and then it goes like this and it's got this tail and it goes a long way okay so what this sperm contains is is a nucleus number one so it will have a nucleus here that's a nucleus and that's gonna carry half dna remember right half dna so it's a special kind of a cell that has half the amount of normal dna in front of it the very frontal part of it remember it's supposed to penetrate the female egg cell it's supposed to go inside the female egg cell so for to make that happen it has this uh, uh this part here in its head that's got digestive enzymes that is able to digest the cell wall uh the, the, the not the cell wall the cell membrane of the uh, of the female egg cell of the ovum so this part part is called the acrosome an acrosome has the digestive enzymes that is able to break down the female egg cell's uh, membrane. The nucleus would have half the DNA, and then it would also have a tail. This tail allows the sperm cell to be able to swim towards the female egg cell. This tail is called a flagellum. Do you remember anywhere else any other kind of cell that has flagellum? We've already studied this prokaryotes usually have a flagellum right for example bacteria so flagellum helps it move or swim towards the female egg cell on top of this it would have a lot of mitochondria because it needs to swim so it needs a lot of energy doesn't it so you, ha you would have a lot of mitochondria in this particular region here so mitochondria nucleus that contains half the dna acrosome and flagellum are the major parts of them and you're expected to know the parts you're expected to know the labeling and you're expected to know the functions of each of the parts okay
um, all of these parts and their functions are labeled, uh, written in your nodes. Okay. So here's uh, an image of some sperm cells trying to penetrate a female egg cell. Only one of them will be able to succeed, and before, after that occurs, the uh, the female egg cell will close its boundaries because one goes in, and it will be able to fertilize the female egg cell. You will get a full DNA cell, and eventually you get a zygote. And again, you know how that goes from there. So zygote will become a clump of cells that will become an embryo, and then a fetus, and you get a you get a baby after a lot of differentiation. The next cell in the series is a neuron, is a nerve cell. What is a neuron? What's a nerve cell? Neurons, or nerve cells, they help in communications between different parts of the body. For example, you could have a temperature receptor in your hand, in your skin. You could have a vibration receptor. You could have a pressure or pain receptor um, anywhere on your skin. You could have other forms of receptors um, that send sensory information, for example, the sense of smell, the self sense of taste, the visual sensation. So all of these need to be communicated to the brain and also the spinal cord. For this to occur, you need specialized cells that are able to carry information over long distances. And those cells will eventually form organs that help carry this information. And I think you're aware of the organs. The organs would be nerves. So <clears throat> Those specialized cells that are able to carry this information over long distances are called neurons or nerve cells. Nerve cells help make up the nervous system, they help make up nerves, and they also help make, us, uh, make up the brain and the spinal cord. Okay, so their function is to <laughs> carry electrical impulses from one place to another. For example, from brain to a part of the body, if the brain is trying to tell uh, a part of the body to do something, or from the body to the brain, right? For example, sensory receptors in the eye to vision center in the brain. So what are some of the parts of a neuron? This will be repeated in its own chapter, but very quickly, a neuron's part consists of the cell body that contains a nucleus. So this is called the cell body, okay? And these extensions uh, multiple extensions that are extending from the cell surface membrane near the body. These are called dendrites. Dendrites. And these dendrites help form connections between uh, different cells. And then we have this long extension of the neuron. This is the key part because this is able to carry information over long distances. Okay, for example, a receptor in your finger all the way to your spinal cord which is quite far away from it, from your finger, right? So this is called an axon, okay? That's called an axon. Now, in other boards, you're expected to know more details, for, but for AQA, that's all you need to know. Cell body, dendrites, axons, and their functions. Axon would eventually connect with another cell, could be a neuron or could be a non-neuron, and whenever there's a connection between a neuron and another cell, may be a neuron or a non-neuron, that is called a synapse. Okay, so over here, that connection that is occurring right here, that would be called a synapse. All right. Uh, the way uh, a synapse kind of looks like is a bit, a bit like this. So we have a neuron here, right? And we've got the axon and it's connecting to this other cell. Now, the way trans information will be transmitted across the synapse is by the use of chemical messengers. So the cells are not actually directly connected. For example, at the bottom image, which is a zoomed in image, you see on the left, the terminal axon, the ending part of the axon on the left is releasing these chemicals, pink colored chemicals, and they are binding to receptors on the adjacent neuron, right? So here is we have the receptors, and these are chemicals that are being released from that, uh, from the cell on the left to the cell on the right. That's how trans information is transmitted. I'm not going to go into more details on this because this will be repeated in enough detail in its own chapter. Okay? Right now, what you need to know is what a neuron is, um, what it, what it's made of, and generally um, what the function of a neuron is. 
Now, one other type of cell that stem cells can get specialized to are muscle cells. Muscle cells form <laughs> the muscles, right? We have different kinds of muscles. We have the skeletal muscle that help us move. We have the muscle in our heart that's called a cardiac muscle. We have the muscle in our gastrointestinal tract, in the esophagus, in the intestines, in the stomach, and those are called smooth muscles. So we'll come to that later, but right now we have to focus on cells. And uh, for the cells to be specialized, we have to understand the function of muscles. What is the function of muscles? A muscle generally is an organ that is supposed to contract, right? That is supposed to contract. So for example, uh, let's talk about the bicep, right? Um, five fingers, okay, so here is an arm right and you all of you guys are very familiar with what the bicep is so here's the bicep muscle and the role of this is to pull the arm towards the shoulder right to be able to flex how is it able to do this the way it's able to do this is by contracting contract means to shorten in size to get smaller so the muscle is able to contract in size which means that it goes from this right to it comes here right and flexes up and pulls the arm towards it um, because it's attached to the arm by a tendon okay so muscles function is to be able to contract to be able to cause movement so the cells that make up the muscles have to be able to contract as well isn't it and that is really the function of the cell. So we need certain types of cells that are able to contract and shorten in size and then relax. And that brings us to muscle cells. So muscle cells, um, especially skeletal muscle cells, are kind of, kind of like these long cylindrical fibers, fiber, fiber type cells. And they have multiple nuclei and stuff. And essentially what they're able to do is that they have these proteins these lines here that I'm drawing, these are contractile proteins, these fibrous bands of proteins that are able to pull everything inwards, okay? So it's able to pull everything inwards and it kind of becomes like this, right? So one cell is able to become shorter because of the pulling in mechanism of these fibrous proteins, this muscular contractile proteins, than the entire cell, uh, than the entire <clears throat> muscle organ can also contract and become shorter in size and that's how a cell works so let's have a look at your neat notes muscle cells they contain contractile proteins that allow muscle cells uh, to contract and hence the muscle cells contract and relax they contain many mitochondria to supply them with energy to store glycogen which can be broken down into glucose of course, for a contraction, you're going to need, need a lot of energy, so they're going to have a lot of mitochondria. And does anybody know what glycogen is? What is glycogen? Have you heard of this before? We have a whole lecture on this later. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose in humans, right, and in animals. So glycogen is the storage form of glucose. If you eat a lot of glucose, a lot of calories, I just ate a cake myself, I'm probably going to go in my body, not be used directly, but be stored as glycogen in my muscles or somewhere else. So glycogen is the storage form of glucose and it can very quickly be broken down back into glucose so that we can do aerobic respiration. Remember, glucose plus oxygen gives energy plus CO2 plus H2O in the mitochondria. So that's muscle cells. Next up, we have root hair cells. Root hair cells are quite simple. Remember the roots? The plants have roots. Do you remember that? Have you heard of a root before? Of course you have. So let's draw a plant here. Um, here is a tree or something, right? And then we have a plant. And then this plant has this root going on, which is able to apparently absorb water, right? It's supposed to absorb water. So how does root work? How do roots work and how are they adapted for their function? Well, roots actually, if I were to zoom in on this, right, roots actually have these cells. And those are called root hair cells. Root hair cells kind of look like this, is that they have this projection from, this, from their cell membrane extending outwards. And this projection is called a root hair. Okay, 
So that's a cell. Now, the root hair cells, they have a nucleus, of course, right? And they have a vacuole in which the water and everything is going to go. And they have a lot of mitochondria, and I'll tell you why that is. So they have mitochondria. So the function of root hair cells is to be able to absorb water and absorb nutrients. How are they able to do this? Well, one of them is to be able to facilitate diffusion of water. De facilitate diffusion of water. How do you facilitate diffusion? If you remember from your year 8 and year 7 studies, diffusion is the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. <clears throat> the greater the surface area, the area available for diffusion, the greater is the rate of diffusion. Root hair cells have these extensions of cell membranes that increase the surface area so that there's more area available for the movement of molecules to come in into the water, uh, into the root hair cell. For example, water moving in, anything else moving in, greater area. So increased surface area to volume ratio for the same amount of volume, it has a lot of surface area. Number two, which is also very important, is that these root hair cells, they have these, these active transporters, these special channels that are able to use energy to actively pull in some of the ions. For example, they can have something like, uh, you can have something like nitrate ions, right? So here's a nitrate ion. Let's say there's a lot of these here inside the cell right? A lot of nitrate ions are inside the cell and very less outside. So how are you going to get, how are, you, how are you going to go from a low concentration to a high concentration? Of course you need energy for it, don't you? So you have this active transport protein that is going to use energy from the mitochondria to be able to pull actively the mineral ions into the root hair cell. So it has write that down here active transport proteins that's an adaptation and it has a lot of mitochondria I would I wouldn't write this in bracket I would not want you to use this part but use this for your answer and use this one they have many numerous mitochondria numerous mitochondria that provide energy for the active transport. So if a question on this comes up, make sure you use this one and this one, okay? Another adaptation for the root hair cells is that they have a very large vacuole, right? Very large vacuole to be able to store all the water that's coming in, okay? Large vacuole. <clears throat> so let's write that down. Large vacuole. And the third thing that you might be able to see here, a component of plant cells that is missing. What component of plant cells would be missing from root cells? What do you think? Root hair cells would not contain what component? Well, of course, the chloroplast, right? The chloroplast would not be present. Remember what a chloroplast looks like? Kind of like this, right? It's got these stacks of chlorophyll. Mm-hmm. And the function of the, of, the chlor of the chloroplast is to be able to do photosynthesis. A chloroplast would not be present in a root hair cell. And the reason for this is because chloroplasts are supposed to do photosynthesis by using light energy. Do roots receive any light? Of course not. Usually, roots are present deep under the ground. And so they do not receive any light, which means we do not need to have any chloroplasts in the root hair cells. What does that do? That gives us more volume, right? It gives us a lot of volume, store more ions and more water into the root hair cells. All right, so let's just uh, very quickly write that down here. No chloroplast, which increases volume for storage of materials, okay? Very uh, quickly read this through again. So root hair cells function absorption of water and mineral ions from the soil. Features. 
Extensions of cell membrane and cytoplasm called root hair, which increase surface area to volume ratio for better absorption. They have many mitochondria to supply energy for active transport. And they do not have any chloroplasts because there is no light for photosynthesis, which increases the volume that is present in the cell to be able to absorb uh, more material from the outside. Okay? Now, after you absorb these materials, like water and mineral ions, you're going to need something to transport them to different parts of the plant, wouldn't you? And that brings us to the next type of cells, and those are called xylem cells. So every root hair cell will be supplied by essentially a vascular tissue, a pipe, a vessel that's going to take the absorbed materials, water and dissolved mineral ions, up from the roots to the rest of the plant. And those are called xylem vessels, which are made of xylem cells. So let's begin. So how do xylem uh, vessels work? Well, xylem, let me just quickly show you here. The way this would work is that, again, you have a plant, right? For example, you have a tree, and then you have the leaves up there, and then you've got the roots over here, and the roots are absorbing water. Now what's going to happen is you want something, a pipe, a vessel, to be able to transport everything that is absorbed in the roots to the rest of the plant. For example, all the way to the leaves, right? Like a straw. And that is a xylem vessel. So we have many, 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 many xylem vessels in different plants. And xylem vessels are made up of xylem cells that are able to transport water one way from the roots to the leaves, okay, upwards. How does this work? How is water just moving against gravity just like that? The answer to this actually is because leaves are special. It's connected to the leaves, and remember leaves, right? That's what a leaf looks like, I think. Remember what a leaf is? Leaves actually are constantly losing water, okay? Water is just diffusing out of them, and we'll learn how that works. And that's called transpiration, but we'll learn how that works. But once water leaves here, remember, it's a straw, right? It's kind of like a straw. Because it's a straw and you're losing water here, it's just going to create a suction pull to pull more water from the roots, okay? So a suction pull is generated because water is constantly leaving the leaves to the air, to the atmosphere. It generates a suction pull that sucks water um, up through the xylem vessels from the roots all the way to the leaves, one way transport. So for this water transport and anything dissolved in it, that's going to be the mineral ions, to occur, you need cells. Cells that are specialized for their function, and this is the function. So how, how are those cells? What do they, how do they look like and what, what features do they have? Let's have a look. So xylem cells. Xylem cells, as you can see on the left um, down here, this is a xylem cell, and then that's another one, and that's another one, and that's another one. A bit weird, right? But that's how it looks like. So these are xylem cells, and if you notice, they are hollow on the inside. And as they're connected, they don't actually have any cell membrane between them, right? They're hollow on the inside, and they don't have any cell membrane. And can you see a nucleus? No. Can you see <coughs> organelles? No. So essentially, they are pretty much dead when mature. Xylem cells, they lack cytoplasm and they lack organelles. So when mature, they are dead at maturity. How does that help? That helps because if you don't have any organelles obstructing the flow, then the flow is going to be very, very smooth, right? Now, xylem vessels, xylem cells, they would conduct water and minerals from the roots to the leaves, right? One directional, unidirectional flow. It transports upwards from the roots to the leaves, again, because the leaves are the ones that are losing the water and generating a suction pull, so it pulls the water to the, to the leaves all the way from the roots. Now, something very, very, very important is that all the xylem in a plant is lined by a very rigid material called lignin, okay? 
So all of this is going to be line by lignin. I'm drawing lignin here. So it's in spirals here. That's called lignin. What does lignin do? Lignin is a very rigid material. And because it is present in xylem, and xylem is supposed to go throughout the plant from the roots to the leaves, then what you're going to have is a very strong support, rigid support throughout the cell. The more xylem you have, the more lignin you're going to have and the more support that you're going to have. So it is lined by rigid material called lignin, which helps provide structural support to the plant. Okay, and that helps make sure that the plant is upright. And if a strong wind blows, the plant does not fall down, right? And that's really what we call the dead wood material. The tree bark is essentially made up of these uh, lignin accumulations, okay? <clears throat> well, if we have this transport going from the roots to the leaves, the leaves are also making some things, aren't they? It's not just the roots that is absorbing things. The leaves are also making some things, aren't they? When we started this chapter, we said leaves contain uh, plant cells that have chloroplasts and they con conduct photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis would produce glucose, and glucose can be converted into amino acids that help make proteins, and lipids or fats. So, all of those materials from the leaves have to be transported as well. And for that, we need some other kind of vessel. So from the leaves, we want to take material to different parts of the plant, to the roots, right, and to different parts, the stems and the fruits and everywhere else. So we want to take these materials such as glucose, right, so the leaf is making glucose, right, it's making uh, amino acids, which help make protein, <clears throat> it's making lipids or fats, and we want to be able to transport these things. To be able to transport them, we need uh, special kinds of vessels. Those vessels that transport these materials, glucose, amino acids, lipids, these are called phloem, okay? Xylem for water and minerals, and phloem for glucose, amino acids, and lipids. And again, these will be dissolved in water. So water is still here, plus water. Water is still here, but um, we have glucose, amino acids, and lipids, which are not found in xylem vessels. Now, phloem transports from the leaves to different parts of the plant. Not, it's not a unidirectional flow. It doesn't go one place. It doesn't, for example, it doesn't go from roots to leaves or leaves to roots. It goes from the leaves to different parts. And therefore, uh, we will say this is a multi-directional flow rather than a unidirectional flow, wouldn't it? So to be able to ma to to be able to transport these manufactured materials, we're going to be able to we're going to need uh, some different kinds of cells, right? And that will that brings us to the phloem cells. Phloem cells kind of look like this. Now let's very quickly go over the features first, and then we'll uh, come back to the diagram. So the phloem cells they transport organic nutrients, for example, sugars and amino acids and lipids, from leaves to other parts of the plant. We also call this source to sink. So we say this is the source. The leaves are the source, and then everything else that where they're going is the sink. So from leaves to different parts of the plant, source to sink, or bi-directional flow or multi-directional flow. Now it comprises of something called sieve tube elements or sieve plates and companion cells. So every cell in a phloem tissue is called a sieve tube element. Um, also called seed plates in a cubic. Now, right next to these, they also have something called companion cells. Each of them will also have companion cells. These companion cells would have a nucleus and they would have mitochondria to provide energy for uh, the phloem cells there. The phloem cells themselves don't have a nucleus and they don't have uh, mitochondria. Now, the reason why they have this companion cell, each of them would have a companion cell, let's just draw one for each, right? The reason why they have these companion cells is because they need energy to function. And that energy comes from the companion cell. They do not make their own energy because they need to, obviously, transport materials. And you don't want the transport to be obstructed by the, uh, by the organelles. So, they require energy from companion cells to function. They're alive, therefore, at maturity because 
<laughs> they have this energy, right? And they have their own cytoplasm. And in between them, um, there is a cell membrane and a cell ball with pores, right? If you notice this place here, it kind of looks like a sieve, right? You know to see this? And that structure is called a sieve plate. So sieve tube elements form phloem, which help make the phloem tissue, which transports organic nutrients produced through photosynthesis from the source, which is the leaves, to the sink, different parts of the plant. For example, the roots, the fruit, uh, the stem, and so on. All right, so that brings us, I think, to the end of this video. So who wants to take a break? We can take a break if you promise to come back even more attentive, okay? Be more attentive. And also, this is a very, um, very quick lecture, very, sh I've tried to make this short, so it would be great if you can review this video a couple of times, okay? And if you have any questions, you can always let me know in the comments. You can buy these notes by contacting through the WhatsApp link below, and uh, to get private coaching for your specific needs, you can contact us right now using the WhatsApp link below. And I really emphasize on this because if you just learn the content, and I speak this as honestly as I can, if you just learn the contents, you're not going to be able to get that nine, okay? You need exam practice. You need very guided exam practice. And if you have a good teacher, that's wonderful. But if you are looking for a great teacher, just contact, okay? All right, have a good one. I'll see you. See you guys in the next one.